Hello and welcome. Today I have a slightly different video just to demonstrate how I go about some day-to-day -day data processing operations. So yesterday uh, we had a meeting that I was invited by Renzo Huber. Here you can actually see the recording of that meeting in Layer fMRI channel where Sam and Andrew together with Renzo presented their project that is currently still ongoing. And we had a couple of discussions about how to process data differently, maybe better and so forth. So this is Sam, Andrew and Renzo. And in, during the meeting, we were discussing several times about how to segment the cortex in the best way. And of course, there are lots of softwares available to do it, free surfer like FSL, SPM, Brain Voyager, whatever. But this is a bit of a challenging case because uh, their data is really challenging. So they have 70 fMRI data set, and it is not only conventional Bolt, it is Vaso fMRI. And they have this partial coverage. And basically what they wanted to do is to segment I think it's like visual word form area or like place area or something. I, I'm not an expert of this area. So like some place in the ventral temporal uh, cortex. And what they wanted to do is to basically just use the fMRI data to be able to segment the cortical tissue in their region of interest. And they were saying that this is very hard to do. And indeed, then Eli came and said, he agrees that this is also very hard to do, like just to understand the 3D convolutions of the cortex. So I believe that there is a middle ground in the beginning when you are trying to like kind of feel how you should start segmenting a challenging MRI brain image. So I, I uh, worked on challenging data sets quite a bit in the past and I have a way of going about it. And actually yesterday we talked that maybe it might be a good idea for me to like give a quick tutorial about how I would segment such a challenging data set. Of course I agreed to it and then Renzo sent me the data set last night. And now what I want to do here in this video, basically I would like to have a look at this data set and just try to analyze it. Like this is my first try although I did have a look at it a bit last night just to check my setup because I'm on a new laptop and like I don't have all the tools that I usually have in my Linux workstation. So I wanted to just challenge myself and see if I can do it or not. Okay, I thought of a plan of attack, which is written here, you can have a look. But basically, like in this video, I will be quite a bit... Um, like I am, I will not bother too much explaining why I am doing certain things, but I would just like to show you that, uh, like how I would go about in a case that you you have a lot of unknowns and you cannot use like those big uh, automatic algorithms so easily. Okay, so first, let's have a look at our data set quickly. So this is a VASO fMRI image that is time averaged. And basically what we have here is the um, average of the whole time series. And in the VASO contrast, due to the dynamic division involved, you have a T1 weighted image that comes out of your fMRI data. You can see that this is partial coverage. We have only a part of the brain. If I was involved in this project from the beginning, I might have given like some suggestions with regards to what type of anatomical data to acquire or like maybe different contrast to acquire. I am not going to do that I will, and I will just work with what I have. And what I have is only this single 3D volume and what the users want to do is to segment the cortical gray matter around this region as far as I understand from their uh, screenshots. Okay, first thing to do is to just have a look at the header of this data set a little bit. For 
having a look at the header of the nifty data set i recently started using nemath program and basically you pass the path to it and when you don't say anything else it just shows you the header and in the header i can see that this is a data set that is approximately 0 0.85 millimeter isotropic resolution with 36 slices in z and 206 uh, x and y okay fine this point 85 is all right and what i heard is that actually they want to analyze their data set around 0.2 millimeter isotropic resolution which happens to be the optimal resolution for the default parameters of the Laney software where uh, Renzo and I develop uh, layer fMRI like algorithms and programs here so with that in mind I'm going to basically put this data set in point around 0.2 millimeter isotropic resolution first okay to do that I'm going to use the convert 3d program here you can see where I got this program. So I usually use it in the terminal, but I like, I, this is my first time in Mac. So I just installed it and it gave me a GUI uh, yesterday. So I'm going to just work with that. Okay, now I have the Convert3D user interface. And here, what I would like to do is to run the following program. This is my input image. I would like to interpolate this to um, around 2 0 0.2 millimeter isotropic resolution. Resample 400%. And we can call the output VASO mean 4x. Oh, I should have called interpolation. Okay, now we execute and wait a little bit. Okay, the interpolation is done. Now let's check it out in ITK Snap. Okay, here we go. I will adjust the contrast a little bit and should be fine. Yes, and you can see that this is basically now interpolated to around 0.2 millimeter isotropic resolution. And we can confirm that by checking the header. See, all these numbers are now uh, decreased by four factors okay the next step is to determine the region of interest however I call it slightly differently I call it the scoop of interest and hopefully the reason will be clear once you see it okay we are in ITK snap and I know that the region of interest is around here, I believe. I mean, if I'm slightly wrong, it doesn't matter too much because this is just a proof of concept anyway. Okay, so without explaining too much, just see what I'm doing. Okay, so I use this segment 3D like function in ITK snap to basically create a bubble around my region of interest. You can see that now I can increase the bubble radius and add it. And now we have a nice clear scoop here. I can click next. And if I want, if this is like not large enough you can grow it a bit see it's growing but i'm happy with that it's fine and i click finish so now i basically have a have this scoop around my region of interest 
I'm going to save it. Okay. Close it. So now what to do with this scoop? I am going to mask our image with this scoop using Nemath. Hopefully you can see the which command I'm using. And at the end, what we get is basically everything that is outside of that scoop is zeroed out in the image. Oh wait, my keyboard setup is not showing all the parameters, like all the key presses I am pressing. Okay, now you should be able to see what I'm pressing. Okay, fine. So this is our region of interest. Next, uh, what I'm going to do is to filter this image a little bit. You can see that it is quite a bit noisy. Of course, this is data originally at acquired at 0.85 millimeter isotropic resolution and now we are like upsampling it and we are trying to see intricate details of the cortex but the, the data is recorded at a lower resolution so ideally i would say maybe you it's better if you can afford to acquire like a 0.4 millimeter anatomical image or maybe even lower point uh, 3.35 millimeter isotropic image and by the way when i say it like i i really mean it and th th this is actually a part of my current research like there is no substitute for acquiring your data at at a higher resolution if you want to see the details at like really fine details and if you can do you can afford maybe like one scanning session to get like really high resolution images of your data rather than like trying to force your way through like upsampling to fmri data and so forth anyway if you are interested you can have a look at this paper about like high resolution anatomical imaging okay now i would like to run a filter and for that i am going to use a little tool that i have written a couple of years ago it's a uh, it's a nonlinear and isotropic diffusion filter. And I'm going to just run it because this takes a while. Okay, we will keep this running. In the meanwhile, when it is running, I would like to edit a bit my scoop. Because there is a big chunk of tissue there that I want to just discard and that is the cerebellum it will help us in the future in the next steps okay now let's load the whole image as an additional image and let's draw our scoop So hopefully you can see. I should adjust this guy a little bit. Ah, okay. This is a bit better. Okay, now I will also activate the other camera. Whoop. Hey. <laughs> so one important point is, is this guy. That is a... So this is a drawing tablet from Wacom I mean you can buy like other brands too I don't care I just like uh, Wacom the most and it requires a bit of training to be able to use this guy effectively however if you are going to invest your time in like high accuracy and precision like tissue segmentation processes it is a good investment to have it it comes with a, a pen digital and basically you look at your screen while your hands are drawing on the tablet it takes a bit of time to synchronize but like i mean if you practice with it for a week you will get it it can be frustrating at the beginning but it it, it really worth your investment to to be able to do it and many people try to <laughs> kind of cheat by like going to tablets uh, like ipads with the screens 
I think they can be used nicely too. However, the problem is that there are no native apps there that allows you to segment uh, like nifty images. So it is a bit laggy and the hardest thing to deal with while doing what I'm going to do next is to deal with the lag. You need you need to have a really fast responsive device to kind of spend the least effort doing this manual um, editing work that I'm going to show you next. Okay, like anyway, um, okay now I am in ITK Snap. Oh, by the way, I set my um, tablet, uh, drawing tablet shortcuts in a way that they map to page up, page down. And that is very useful in ITK Snap because I can quickly go back and forth. Or maybe I should change the linger time of this guy a bit. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a brush and select clear label. I will go and make a very large circular brush. I'm going to adjust my contrast a little bit so that I see these structures easier. Okay. So now what I want to do is to basically get rid of the cerebellum. Like so. But of course, doing it for every uh, slice is cumbersome, especially at this upsampled resolution. Uh, therefore, I'm going to do it for. Um, I'm going to do it by jumping. Why is it shoving this guy? I don't like it. Mm. Wait, let me check my Wacom setup. Okay. Now I don't have that annoying uh, thing anymore. Okay, so let's go. Now I will go one, two, three, four, five. I'll go one, two, three, four, five. So I will just do this for a bit. So I'm not looking to be extremely precise here because this will be kind of a rough mask to get our initial segmentation and then we will do the like more detailed polishing. Okay, this side is done. I can go to that side. Okay, it looks good. So I will stop doing the manual work right now. And now I'm going to save this file. And we are going to do a little operation on it. So let's open a new tab while this is going. So I'm going to erode two times and I'm going to dilate two times this binary image and let's see what will be the effect. If you don't know what erosion dilation means just search for it. I'm not going to explain now but it's basically like some simple morphological operations. Okay, now let's load it. Oh, look. <laughs> All these extra slices that we would have been worrying about, like manually erasing, is already gone. What is kind of maybe you might be seeing is this like rough shape. But that's all right for now. I was not trying to be so precise anyway. We can live with it for now. Okay. So then what I'm going to do is to basically wait uh, for the filter to finish. And then we are going to uh, like getting our tissue labels. 
okay uh, while this filter is finishing I'm going to give you a few details first is about segmentator this is a little Python live like toolbox that I have developed together with Marian Schneider in 2018 and you can actually come to the github repository and see how to install it and see a few details about it about the filter that I was using you can go to the wiki and see the nonlinear anisotropic smoothing part and there there are a couple of like initial pointers if you are interested in what this filter is with a few other notes I know that Afni has an implementation of this filter too but here today what I'm like the way I'm using it has some tweaks in it and those tweaks are things that we need to make use of today okay about those like tweaks and little tricks actually they are not secret hidden things you can read about segmentator in general in in this paper um, 2018 and there is a whole like a theory behind the this program and you can also see the supplementary figures where we show a case where this nonlinear anisotropic smoothing filter is useful to mitigate or, or deal with highly noisy data. Supplementary figure 5, you can have a look at it. The next thing I would like to show you is from my 2020 paper. Here, so in this paper, I was segmenting a very challenging and old MRI dataset, and there I needed to enhance the sulci to be able to segment it, the, the whole brain. This was a whole brain segmentation like challenge actually o although like there are many like neuroscientific parts about it what I would like to highlight is this part cortical segmentation and here I am detailing a bit how we make use of this nonlinear anisotropic filter in a specific way to enhance the sulci so you can get your pointers from here if you are interested and I recommend you to check the figure 12. For instance, here you can see that in this blurry image at this region, the sulcus here is enhanced after running this filter. And many other details, but I'm not going to go into them right now. Okay, our filter has finished. It took 20, uh, 41 minutes. Let's have a look at the effect of this filter. So I load my masked image, that was the initial image, and then I'm going to show you each iteration of this, like each fifth iteration of this filter to give you the idea. Okay, here you can see that I'm looking at the, my region of interest. Okay, now we will go five iterations. 10, 15, 20. Again, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20. With the parameters that I set. Okay, and what did happen? Did it help us? So let's have a look at this case, for instance, this sulcus here. Which one is easier to see? The initial image or after? 10 iterations or after 20 iterations. Also, let's have a look at maybe some white matter, intricate white matter parts. Like here. How the image is evolving. Of course, I would like to highlight that this is still a smoothing operation. Although it is nonlinear and it is anisotropic, it is still smoothing. So it will force some um, structures inside your data. And maybe you don't want to have them. But like my point here is that by using this filter in this case, that is like upsampled, kind of noisy like uh, image, and we want to segment it, it is actually useful because like after, let's say we decided to use 20 uh, iteration version of it. If we are in doubt in the original image, oh, is this like a sulcus here? Where should I 
Like where should I put my outer gray matter boundary? Maybe the filtered version can give us a hint about where to put it correctly. Like we are literally squeezing the signal out of our data by using this filter. Okay, the next thing I'm going to show you is what to make like what to do with this filtered image now. I'm going to mask it with my cerebellum removed scoop and I'm going to name it um, like so. Okay, and now I'm going to call segmentator, not segmentator filters, but segmentator. You can, like what I'm going to show you now, you might be able to do it in some other programs too, or writing your own custom code. But this is just like what is convenient for me right now. Oh, one thing I forgot to add here um, is actually saying use the macOS X backend just to make it look nicer on the screen. I might do a bit of maintenance of this program soon. I just didn't find time to maintain it for a couple of years now. Okay, it's doing stuff. It's generating a GUI, hopefully, and let's see how it will look like. And this step, I call it probe descriptors. Oh, by the way, like I, I realized that I forgot to add the, the cerebellum removal part, and I went ahead and added it to this list. So this is the GUI that we are seeing. I'm going to zoom a bit here. The orientation of this image doesn't matter. Oh, I see that I forgot a little like region to, to remove it, but that, that's all right. I can remove it later. Um, and now what we see on the left hand side is a 2D histogram. On the X axis, there's the intensity. So white is like here, grays are there, darks are there. And on the Y axis, there is gradient magnitude. And if you don't know what it is, just have a look at this paper and the literature within. Maybe figure one can help you to understand what's going on. But that's not so crucial right now. I'm just going to like probe like which tissues are where. Okay. You can see the controls of segmentator here, by the way. If you are not sure like which buttons I'm pressing, which clicks I'm pressing. And see, look, all these like white stuff. Also, this is another way of probing the tissue. All this white matter stuff lives here. And the gray matter stuff lives there. And the sulcus stuff lives there. Luckily, we don't have too many bright arteries and veins otherwise they would be like living up here in this ROI okay this looks fine what I'm going to do now is to capture quickly two tissues so here you can see that maybe just a simple intensity thresholding can give us a like a good enough starting point uh, an intensity value around like this number 0 0.378 let's say yeah okay uh, and for the white matter we can get like this okay fine can just go ahead with this probe Okay, export nifty. And now I'm going to move it a bit to the right to catch the white matter. I just try to be like uh, overall correct, not in detail. Okay, hopefully it worked. Yes, we have these two files. Now what I'm going to do is to create a like initial segmentation file out of it. Nemoth. So here it is like this is important. We, I am going to put my all field of view image. I am going to put my must image. 
and I'm going to put my filters image. So these are all like different sources of information that can help me, that can guide my uh, decisions when I'm deciding on the tissues. Now I can put my initial segmentation here. See, we have something, there are some pieces that we should get rid of, but overall it looks okay. Now, what I would also like to add here, this is a bit more for didactic, didactic reasons, the gradient magnitude of this guy. So there's a new program that is coming up in the next uh, Laney version. It's called ln 2 Gramac, and basically it computes gradient magnitude. This is a quite an easy operation, so you can implement it in like MATLAB, in Python, whatever, in AFNI, probably in FSL. Okay, now I'm going to also compute the gradient magnitude of the filtered image. So let's load this one too, just to see. Okay, now let's highlight them a bit. 0 0.1, yeah, good. Okay, now let's have a look for a moment to this gradient magnitude image. So what are we seeing here? Well, for instance, look here. There's a sulcus probably here around the grammar. Oh, I can switch to my original image. And see, oh yeah, it's it's a it's a sulcus here. It's gray matter, cortical gray matter. I look at the filtered version. Yeah, it looks fine. I understand it a bit. So now I can have a look at the gradient magnitude of the unfiltered image, and it just looks like noise. I don't see anything meaningful. However, when I look at the gradient magnitude of the filtered image, all of a sudden, this image highlights the edges that I have available in the data. You can actually see how nicely, in a way the gray matter, cortical gray matter is popping up in this filtered version of our initial image. And you can see that how the sulcus is like clearly, um, or at least like in, in a much more clear way, uh, highlighted. So the, all these things can now can guide us to do the manual work. So I'm going to activate my tablet view and start doing the manual work. Okay, so now this will be the, the, the point where I will be doing my manual polishing. And let's see how much time it will take. It is 13, 14 now. So I will not talk too much. You can just watch it. I will probably speed it up in the future too. Oh, like here, my purpose is to basically get as good segmentation as possible inside my region of interest. Of course, like the area that you are interested in might be just here or might be just there. But what I find useful over the years is actually it it is it is like easier for the future to do more advanced analysis if you do more than what you minimally need. So if you need only this sulcus, like segment it a bit more than that, and and maybe ab about that, like the the future potential, like. Um, advanced analysis i can either have a different video or maybe talk about it at the end let's see depending on how much time it will take uh, and of course like what i am doing right now I, I am very trained to do it so i am very very experienced and the things that i am seeing and removing right now maybe doesn't make sense to you like when you look at it without too much experience but yeah just Trust me that it works and you will arrive to the same point if you practice a bit. But it can be frustrating at the beginning to, to understand what is like part of the cerebellum, what is a, a big artery, what is sulcus, what is a big vein or a small vein, depending on your resolution. Or what are, if you are segmenting post-mortem data set, what are um, like uh, dead tissue artifacts? Some things can be torn apart, some cracks might, might appear, and so forth. 
Oh, by the way, like uh, I I talk about it and I'm experienced and I would like to show you, like for instance, this paper that I'm very proud of, proud of actually that I'm a part of it. In this paper, we have segmented 34 primate species. And basically what I was doing in this group is that I was segmenting the hardest data sets that are the most noisy and like literally the, 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 the worst cases to deal with. And yeah, I like learned a lot of things by doing these challenging exotic primate brains. Yeah, then I segmented dolphin brains and so forth too, but that's, uh, that's another story. Okay, oh, let's go.
Okay, now I will stop with my manual segmentation for a bit and apply a couple of morphology operations. So here I uh, binarize my segmentation with two classes. I erode it one time. I apply Gaussian smoothing. So this breaks the binary nature of the data, makes it floating point precision between 0 and 1. Then I threshold everything below 0 0.5 to 0 and then I binarize it, which means that I am basically making everything non-zero equal to 1. Then I am dilating it to get a, like a white matter and gray matter mixed map. Yeah, white matter looks pretty good. I think it's good enough for the first pass. <laughs> and let's see if there are like some floating stuff. Not so much. Okay, just to reduce the floating stuff, I will do something now. So this basically says that there are 25 clusters and the biggest cluster is labeled 1. So I'm just going to leave that one. This is kind of a minor thing. Looks all right. I mean, this can be like improved further and tweaked but also like we need to know where to stop because the, the data is data and like we cannot force something that is not there okay now let's see if this segmentation works good enough or doing a couple of things ah by the way uh, first i need to get rid of these extra floating red pieces okay that's good that i remembered this is just for making stuff work easier in the future, like, but uh, I will not explain exactly why I'm doing it. So these floating stuff, I just want to like, get rid of them. And this is how, this is one way of doing it now I'm showing you. Okay, the biggest one is still the one, so that's good. Okay, so this is a kind of a nice, okay, good enough initial segmentation to begin with. And, um, I will not do any manual work on top of it, although you can do it in, in principle in a few days. Maybe you can make another person check it so that maybe you are not biasing your segmentation a certain way, like having two thin uh, cortex or two thick sulci and things like that. But anyway, for now, it is good enough. I think I made my point here with regards to the tools I am using uh, to, to accomplish this. Now I will not do any more manual segmentation, so I will turn off the camera. Okay, so now, well, huh, look at the time. We didn't even spend one hour doing this. This nice scoop with like nice gray matter segmented on it. Uh, of course, like 
if we were to be interested in an area like here, this segmentation would not be good enough. We need to segment like more around there, but I just assume as far as I saw, like they are interested in maybe here, maybe there. And this is a good enough starting point that we can get in one hour. With the remaining time, let's see how some of the Laney algorithms work once we have this segmentation. Okay, first thing to do. For Laney, we need to create a rim file and therefore we need to label everything that is not gray matter or white matter here too, the outside of gray matter. How do we do it? So this is like one way of doing it, I will show you now. Okay, this I think looks all right. Now let's remify. Uh, I always forgot the inputs. Although I write, wrote the program. <laughs> Inner gray matter blue is three. Outer gray matter one. There we go. This is the format that Laney likes. Oh, by the way, look at this small trick. I can hide the red stuff. Okay, now let's see how we will do. So basically, like I can remove all the other stuff, and like once I arrived here. Let's run. Let's get some layers with it, huh? Oh, look, new outputs. Ah, there we go. Our layers. Well, I mean, this doesn't look so nice, uh, so we can just <laughs> clear it. Doesn't matter. So these are binarized layers in this region. However, uh, I was telling this in the meeting maybe ranting a bit about it, I'm sorry for that. Um, I recommend you to have a look at this metric file. Metric. What is this file? So you load it as an additional image and look, this is just a distance field, normalized distance field or norm, like, basically each value here is a floating point precision value that is between 0 and 1. 0 is your inner gray matter border, 1 is your outer gray matter border. They do not become exactly 0 and 1 due to reasons that I'm skipping right now. We can discuss in the future. But actually, like all we do is that we get this file and then if the user wants two layers, we just make everything below 0 0.5 one value and above another value. If you have three layers, we like quantize it in that way. So it's not a big deal. I, I just want to emphasize that maybe you should consider before arbitrarily binarizing, quantizing your data, working with the a bit more correct to me in my view, uh, like the measurement of the normalized cortical depths. And maybe consider doing like a scatter plot rather than live. But anyway, like I just wanted to show you without going into that too much, what else you can do with it. Um, let's load our segmentation again. Oh, wait, uh, let me show you this file. Let's have a look at the mid gray matter file that we also export from LN2 layers. Oh, whoops, something went wrong here. Okay, I just enable it. And here, actually, ITK snap is, I think, smoothing my maps. Therefore, I'm going to disable ITK snap smoothing to show you a bit nicer. Yeah, smoothing was on. Now I will turn it off and see. So this is basically a one voxel tick, like a quick rendering of the of these voxels here. If you see a bit of holes here, don't worry. This is just like a 
uh, visualization issue in ITK Snap. It's not an issue, like, I mean, the algorithm works correctly, but uh, anyway. So now, let's say I would like to flatten, which is a big part of neuroimaging, flattening chunks of cortex. I would like to flatten an area, let's say my activity is around here. I mean, I don't have the functional activity here, so I cannot say it, but let's say it was there. I would like to flatten this region. How can I do it? So basically in this file, I am here. Now I'm going to just label a single voxel. Let's go there. Put one. Yeah, see. Okay. I mean, it might look a bit funny, but uh, there's a reason I do this. So this is a quite a big function. I learned to multilaterate. I'm very excited about it. And actually, like this function is how I was able to do. Like I talk a bit about this function in my paper. So here you can see the scoops I have segmented in a much larger region, like four regions per subject actually in this data set. And basically we are going to do this, having the folded region and then flattening it. Okay, first input is the ring file. Then I pass the control points file. That is my centroid. Oh, by the way, like you can read about this thing <laughs> that I'm showing you in my blog. If you go to the rolling pin for brain chunks, this things on things.org, this is my like little funny blog. We talk all about it. What is this algorithm and how like how it works, if you are curious to do stuff like this. Okay. And now and this is the nice part, I give a radius. Hopefully it will be like obvious to you. What is, does this mean? I give five and this is in millimeters because my nifty headers are correct. And with that, I can just press go. Hopefully it will work. <laughs> I didn't test this uh, bit, bit on this data set before. Doing stuff, computing. Okay, finished. So now Let's load this parameter file. Oh, look, we have a small region. Ah, this is, I think, too small. We can go a bit, like, higher. 15. Yeah, let's try it. So you can see that basically in that little dot I put there, one voxel, I am, um, like, a growing a Petri dish around it. Or, or a cylinder, actually. You would see some. Oh, there we go. Hey, look, we have a nice 15 millimeter disc. 15 millimeter in radius, so 30 millimeter in diameter. And I believe that this region is already much larger than what Andrew and um, Eli often uh, segments going slice by slice and trying to do just like everything manually maybe spending hours so. okay now what to do with this also let me show you the parameter chunk file see this is the whole chunk there and now we are going to flatten it oh this like okay. anyway and by the way, now I would like to show you something really important. And that is, that's a big, um, that's a big new feature in LN2 layers. Look here, curvature. Hmm, what can it be? Also thickness. Now let's export them. So these are just extra outputs and I think for a a detailed quality control you need to have a look at your thickness values 
maybe even report what was the thickness, average thickness in the area that you have segmented, maybe across subjects to see it's consistent first. And also these thickness values can give you insight about what is your effective resolution. Like if you have 0.8 millimeter voxels, but if you have only in your region of interest, maybe 1.5 millimeter thick, like gray matter segmentation, this would this has implications on how many like layers you can see or how how many layers you can interpret with regards to your functional activity whereas maybe in the motor cortex as uh, somatosensory record i don't know which one was a thinner one you have like three millimeter thickness so having 0 0.8 millimeter isotropic functional voxels there has a different meaning in terms of the amount of layers that you might be able to interpret and ascribe to whatever like feed forward feedback stuff okay now let's have a look quickly to this thickness file oh see for the whole rim file now it has computed the cortical thickness and you can see that the value is around 2.7 here I mean, you can write like scripts to um, more thoroughly uh, look at these values. It looks like this is within the realm of the accepted like cortical thickness. Okay, now let's have a look at the curvature files. Curvature. So this curvature, actually we are computing in a very nice way using something called Steiner's formula. It's different than how curvature is computed in triangular mesh based software. And it gives us a it gives us this continuous measurement of the curvature, and you can see that in the circles it like goes dark, in the gyrus it goes light. And what we can do is that basically, and and this is done because like neuroscientists like to have a look at the curvature in a binarized format, in the binarized way too. If I load it as a segmentation, this bin file, I mean, don't worry about this guy. So what we have is, is that basically this kind of tells us in a binary way, where is our sulcus, see here, and where is our gyrus, for instance, there. Um, that's it for now, and we are, I'm going to use it to do something. Okay, now let's continue to explore what advanced things we can do now with Laney, LN2 tools, LN2 layers, LN2 multilaterate, and now I'm going to use LN2 patch flatten. Okay, now it uses a values file, and first I'm going to use this curvature file for that. Then the coordinates that is coming from the multilaterate, and now I'm going to use the depth coordinate that we have comp by the way like you can use other software to parameterize your surfaces too like you don't need to stick with uh, laney this ln2 patch flatten is written in a way that as long as the nifty files have like some parameterization it will work uh, you will see okay now i'm going to enter the domain file oh, these are all explained in the help menu so I'm skipping that part. It's the parameter chunk. Okay. Now I'm going to say beans u. Now I'm going to use Borodoy too. I'm skipping some details, but maybe I will have another video in the future. Okay. Oop. There's a typo. And now let's see what will happen. Okay, here we go. Oh, look, <laughs> our gyrus is now flattened. <laughs> the white is for gyrus, dark is for sulcus. And of course, now I hope that you can imagine, like now I can flatten my functional activity too and then visualize it here. I can browse around different depths 
and see what's changing in my map. So this gives you a very nice convenient uh, perspective, point of view into seeing the landscape, cortical landscape and explore the uh, activity patterns. We, we already have like a couple of abstracts that uses this and some works uh, in, in the, like the preprint draft stage. But yeah, it's all there. Uh, it's all publicly available. And now the final thing. Okay, it's already one hour since we started doing manual segmentation. I can spend five more minutes. So now check this out. Let's do it 3D in the middle layer. Okay, let's say this is whatever, like our activity region, um, maybe some other interesting thing we wanted to highlight and I can just use I think I snap to draw whatever I want to draw. Now let's save it. And now for the final act. And this is new. I implemented this code a couple of weeks ago. I hope it is there. Oh, uh, it's in the development. So um, I was just, I needed to compile it separately. But this will be available in the next version of Lane. Once we release it, once I have a bit of time and we can like, coordinate with Renzo. Okay, now I'm going to unflatten this. And this chords XYZ is a new output that is coming from LN2 patch bulletin. Um, this one, folded chords. And the reference. This could be what we gave to LN2 patch, patch bulletin. Okay, now. Let's call it our output. Okay, now let's go back to our folded brain. Here, this image. Let's make it look a bit nice. And now let's see what this back projected unflattened file is doing. Oh, look, <laughs> what is that? Can you tell? Oh, I'm not able to zoom in in Mac. Hello, Laney. There we go. We transferred from the flat domain into the folded one. And of course, it is very hard to understand uh, in this slice view. But there is information and we revealed it. And as the final thing, just to show you, this was all written inside our 15 millimeter in radius cylinder. There you go. We wrote it in like <laughs> on the sides of the jars. <laughs> so at this point, uh, I would like to say that, yeah, this is uh, how I would go about segmenting a, a challenging partial volume data set given the constraints. And I think many parts of this process can be automatized and different algorithms can be derived. I am actually working on these things in my day-to-day -day work. But I advise that, of course, like, I do not like doing manual work and going through data set like this. I want a big red button and I, when I press it, all these things happen. However, with high resolution imaging at ultra high field right now, we are not at that stage yet. We need to explore which type of approaches work the best that gives us the accuracy and precision we desire in, in the and, and by using our time efficiently, uh, by using the right tools and right techniques to, to accomplish what we want to do and not get stuck in the past or stubbornly insist on doing things in one way. Because as you can see in basically like around two hours, like I am done and I'm just like having fun now.
Okay, that's it. Hopefully this is useful. Maybe in the future I will make more like a lecture format of this. Maybe I can detail like parts of it, why I like did some things and didn't do other things, but that's it. Okay, thanks for listening. Have a nice day. Bye.